a very good morning and welcome to this lecture in me303 heat transfer today we'll be talking about a new topic in convection this is called free convection so in the very beginning of this course we uh, discussed that there are two types of convection the first one is forced convection that we have been talking about till now in which the flow is driven uh, externally and the second one is uh, called free convection where the flow is driven um, naturally due to the um, gravity force well um, actually um, in in free convection um, the the uh, fluid motion is induced due to buoyancy forces so uh, it is not necessary that uh, the, the uh, force the body force which induces the buoyancy force is gravity it can be any body force which is proportional to density and uh, one of the most common body forces which is proportional to density is gravity so it is uh, because of the uh, gradients in density so if you have uh, a fluid which has uh, a gradient in density that is uh, the density is different at different um, heights then um, the gravity will result in a buoyancy force which will then drive the flow but as i said that uh, it can be any body force that uh, is proportional to density which will then result in a free convection situation if there are density gradients so another example is centrifugal force because uh, in a, in a rotating uh, system uh, if if you um, uh, consider things from the uh, frame of the system the um, the centrifugal force which is is proportional to density and hence uh, that also can result that also results in buoyancy oh, sorry that also results in a buoyancy force and hence free convection okay um, in in heat transfer uh, the density gradients typically are because of temperature gradients um, again it's always easy uh, to discuss through examples so you can think of an example of um, um of of air so if you have uh, air which is uh, in in which there is a temperature gradient then that temperature gradient will result in a density gradient because of the property of air um have a temperature being dependent uh, in related to density and that density gradient because of the presence of gravity will result in a, will result in a body force uh, leading will result in a buoyancy force leading to free convection so here uh, we have two situations where uh, we can uh, where uh, we have temperature gradients so let us see the first one that is situation number a so here um, as you can see that the temperature um, i mean uh, we are looking in the y direction so um, sorry so this is our y direction uh, let's use uh, the black color here so this is our y direction so the temperature as you can see um, is increasing um, as we go down or decreasing as we go up okay so as we are going up the temperature decreases so this is called an unstable situation uh, unstable situation because uh, dt by dx is uh, positive okay uh, sorry in this case uh, we um, this is our x coordinate so let's uh, use that so um, gravity is in the direction of the x coordinate so dt by dx in this case is uh, positive because um, um, going down you have the increasing x coordinate so dt by dx is positive that results in d rho by dx which is negative okay so as you go down the uh, density decreases because the temperature is increasing so what that means is you have uh, uh, a lighter a lower density fluid here and a higher density fluid here so that means um, the, the lighter fluid is uh, at the bottom and the heavier is at the top and as we know that the heavier fluid tends to uh, fall down and because of gravity so what what will happen is that it will uh, move down and as the heavier fluid goes down uh, because of the vacuum it creates it will result in a suction 
which will suck in the fluid from the other side and that will result in some sort of fluid circulation okay and of course as the as the um, um, as it, the heavier fluids fall down which is heavier means the cold fluid moves down um, it, it will in, and then get heated because there may, must be some mechanism which is resulting in this fluid to be hotter at the bottom we will discuss more in detail but this is an unstable situation uh, what that means is that in this kind of a situation you will see some sort of fluid circulation the other situation that we have in case number b is is called the um, stable situation so in in the stable situation um, the temperature gradients are stable in the sense that um, the temperature at the bottom is low and at the top is high so um, you already have the cold fluid at the bottom and the heavy the light fluid at the top so although you still have a temperature gradient here and a density gradient uh, resulting uh, resulting from that but still um, you don't have any buoyancy force because the heavier things are at the bottom and the lighter things are at the top so you will not see any um, recirculation here so the only heat transfer that you will see is because of conduction you won't have any flow resulting from this situation of density and uh, temperature and density gradients so the only heat transfer uh, the heat and mode of heat transfer you'll see is conduction if there's no radiation of course and uh, remember um, uh, as we talked about earlier that uh, the resulting flow velocities in free convection are uh, much smaller than what you see in forced convection typically so what that means is that the rate of uh, heat transfer or the heat transfer coefficients we see in this case well i should say heat transfer coefficient because the rate of heat transfer also involves the area uh, which can be high if you have a large area that you're dealing with so the heat transfer coefficient h uh, in these situations so the um, h value is uh, typically much smaller for uh, free convection situations and a couple of examples um, that, that we may want to talk about here are um, uh, buildings so if, if you have these uh, buildings the um, tall buildings then uh, you may have uh, because the building uh, you know, may get heated and then um, it, it gets cold in the evening so you can you, you will have uh, this this the fluid which is uh, contacting the building becomes hot so um, it starts rising rising and then um, that creates some sort of circulation and uh, that that results in um, rate, rate of um, heat, heat heat flowing out of the building through convection okay so because you have some fluid flowing outside the building um, so this is a typical example of um, free convection then the other example is uh, hvac systems so heating ventilation and air conditioning system so you have these typically uh, you have these ducts flowing in uh, buildings etc which are carrying hot or cold air so again because of the temperature on the surface of the duct you, you may have some sort of uh, free convection happening outside this duct as well another another common example is atmospheric currents so in, in the earth's atmosphere uh, because of um, uh, the, the the temperature um, uh, surf at the oceans uh, ocean surface or the earth surface you see that uh, you will have uh, these atmospheric currents of air that will result because of free convection so um we classify uh, free convection situations as um, uh, in one case you, you uh, we classify this based on the um, boundary um, in the, the kind of boundaries you have so the first one is called the free boundary flows so in this case uh, the uh, fluid which is uh, flowing as a result of uh, free convection does not have any boundary confining its flow or uh, constraining its flow um, so um, two um, common examples of uh, free boundary flows are uh, plumes and uh, buoyant jets so let's look at the first one 
so in the first one uh, which is the plume that you see in uh, the, the, this case let's use a different color let that, that that you see in this case so uh, what what you have is uh, you have this hot wire so this is uh, a heated wire and the air just above this wire or uh, the fluid which is just above the wire is heated through uh, conduction and then <coughs> as <coughs> the fluid gets hot because of buoyancy it rises and um, as it rises in in the process um, this this hot fluid uh, what will happen is that it will tend to create some sort of suction which sucks in the cold fluid and uh, which gets hotter when it interacts with the um, with the hot fluid so uh, in the process you have this plume that develops which uh, flows up um, and in, in the process it keeps uh, entraining cold fluid as it goes up okay, and um, here uh, we see the velocity profile so what you see is that in the center you have the maximum velocity as shown here and as you uh, go further to the sides the velocity um, asymptotically goes to zero okay. uh, it's, it's very typical to use the x coordinate uh, for the direction of flow in such situations and the y coordinate which is perpendicular to the direction of flow <clears throat> can we and we see that um, the uh, temperature inside the plume is um, greater than t infinity so t infinity is the temperature of uh, the fluid uh, in the ambient situation where the uh, where the velocity as you can see is zero and the density is rho infinity so uh, inside the plume which is here in in this uh, inside the plume you see that the density is less than rho infinity and the temperature is greater than t infinity So uh, the second example for uh, free boundary flows are buoyant jets. So this is uh, uh, what we have here. So you can see that uh, the water or the fluid in this case is discharged in the um, uh, well, uh, in the x direction, if if we call this x. Um, but because uh, this this uh, this fluid being discharged is at a temperature which is larger or greater than the temperature of the uh, ambient fluid around it so this uh, hot fluid will then start rising in this uh, cold ambient fluid because of buoyancy force so what you see is that although the initial discharge speed or velocity was in the x direction but uh, you will start um, seeing this fluid uh, obta um, obtaining uh, y direction velocities well I shouldn't use x and y because x and y already in the figure are used for uh, the tangential and the normal components so let's call it um, uh, let's call it um, x1 and x2 so although the fluid had um, um, a velocity only in the x1 direction when, when it was discharged but uh, because of the buoyancy force it obtains uh, velocity in the x2 direction as well as you can see here but again uh, there is no constraint for uh, the velocity profile so it is um, asymptotically falling to zero on both directions um, um, in the jet uh, well, towards the end of the jet but in the center line of the jet you see that the uh, tangential velocity peaks as expected and uh, such kind of uh, buoyant jets uh, free boundary flows are uh, very common when uh, you have uh, the hot water being discharged into the uh, cold lakes or streams uh, where the hot water is coming from some sort of uh, power plant okay, which is used for uh, uh, cooling um, uh, condenser fluids the other types of um, free convection flows or free convection situations 
are where uh, the boundary layer is, uh, is is formed on a surface okay so it is a constraint in uh, one or uh, more directions so you have a heated or a cooled surface um, and uh, you will have a boundary layer developing on that um, but, and, uh, because of the flow resulting from pre-convection so now um, for um, the laminar situation for, for a laminar situation let us uh, look at the equations and get some sort of a feel of uh, how the density gradients and the presence of a body force which depends on the density results in uh, a flow situation so let's write our momentum equation Okay, so um, we are looking at a situation where we have a plate well I should have uh, shown that first so you have this um, kind of a plate and this plate let us assume that is um, hotter than the ambient so um, and, and the coordinates we have chosen are the um, x coordinate is along the plate and this is our y coordinate okay, and the surface temperature of the plate is greater than t infinity so this momentum equation that we've written we'll call it the x momentum equation because um, uh, we're interested in this case in the x momentum in fact what, what happens is um, since you have uh, the um, gravity in the negative x direction so um, the fluid that is contacting the um, so the ambient fluid that is touching the plate gets hot starts to rise and because of that we have uh, a boundary layer that is formed um, and, and the flow in the boundary layer is such that of course on the surface you have a no slip condition but uh, sorry so the flow velocity peaks and then it asymptotically uh, falls to zero okay so this is your uh, velocity profile okay, and you have uh, this this we'll call the boundary layer thickness which is a function of x okay and uh, we also have a temperature boundary layer developing on this plate So we have high temperature on the plate and then um, the temperature drops down to the uh, uh, free stream temperature and this we call the temperature boundary layer so delta t again as a function of x so this is uh, what we see in this uh, hot plate where the temperature t 
s is greater than t infinity so this x momentum equation that i have written um, is is what we are interested in as i said so what what we have to see is if if you compare this equation with what we saw earlier then um, you have this body force as well uh, which is in addition to what we had earlier because in earlier we did not have a body force or we neglected that because uh, of uh, the the relative magnitude of uh, the inertial forces which were much higher than the body forces and there is no change in the energy equation the only change that we see as compared to the force convection uh, equations is the contribution of uh, or is the inclusion of this term including gravity so let us um, analyze this a bit further because we really want to see what is uh, the mathematical origin of uh, that buoyancy force which um, uh, has the component of the density gradient in it because um, ultimately remember it's the uh, presence of the density gradient that results in this um, uh, buoyancy force leading to free convection okay so this um, dp infinity by dx is uh, actually you have uh, uh, partial p by partial x uh, but if you remember again we have done this in the uh, fluid mechanics that we can assume that the free stream temperature gradient uh, can be used inside the boundary layer as well in the x direction um, and in this case if uh, you write your um, uh, free stream temperature uh, pressure gradient sorry so this is So this uh, quantity dp infinity by dx in um, this um, region which is outside the boundary layer um, the, the only force balance it has if, if you were to write the x momentum equation in the region outside the uh, boundary layer so there um, what you end up getting is simply uh, this term balanced by uh, the density outside is rho, rho minus rho infinity times g so basically um, outside the boundary layer you don't have any um, uh, viscous effects um, uh, the uh, inertial terms are also gone so what you are left with is uh, simply a balance between the pressure term and the gravity term so this is what you have um, we will call it outside the boundary layer So from this uh, we can replace, so we will call this equation number 1, so using, using 2, so we substitute 2 and 1, so that on um, the right hand side, so dp infinity by dx, so on the right hand side we have a minus 1 by rho well the minus uh, becomes a plus so we have a rho infinity upon rho times g can okay, we already have a minus g here plus you have this uh, viscous term So this we can simplify so we can take um, g common and uh, we have rho infinity uh, minus rho upon rho so which um, plus um, this term we already have these terms and rho infinity minus rho can be written as delta rho okay so this is uh, the um, density difference between the free stream or sorry the ambient we, we shouldn't use free stream because there's no stream here so this is um, 
the density difference between the ambient density and the density inside the boundary layer at that position so we can call it delta rho okay so this is where you see that you have the um, now the gravity term and the effect of the density gradient so let's um, <clears throat> see how we can um, now use the temperature gradient and substitute um, that in terms of the uh, uh, substitute that in place of the density gradient because ultimately it is a temperature gradient which results in the density gradient so for um, for uh, fluids we can use the idea of the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient typically we use a beta for that so beta is uh, minus 1 upon rho del rho by del t at constant pressure okay. so uh, we can then um, um, write this as minus 1 upon rho and then um, del rho can be written as a density difference and uh, del t can be written as the temperature difference between the ambient and the temperature inside the boundary layer so this um, lets it lets us uh, write the um, delta rho upon rho as uh, beta times t minus t infinity okay so we can substitute this delta rho by rho as this um, in, in our um, x momentum equation that we had obtained so finally we have So this is our uh, final momentum equation so we will call it 2 prime so we can clearly see that um, uh, the effect of temperature gradient the temperature difference between the uh, boundary layer temperature and uh, the uh, temperature in the free stream and uh, the um, gravity okay so if there was no gravity then we won't have this term if the temperature inside the boundary layer uh, was uh, the same as t infinity throughout then we'll have the same then then we won't have uh, uh, if, if t was equal to t infinity then we'll also have no contribution from this term and hence we'll have the same equation that we had earlier um, but in this case uh, the boundary conditions are such that the velocity initially is zero so we won't have any velocity okay so we this, this term contributes to the um, development of the velocity inside the boundary layer and remember that we are talking about a steady state situation that's the reason we didn't include a del u by del t term t mean time okay so this is our momentum equation and uh, we we have our continuity equation and the energy equation which are equations which are the same so if I just um, quickly write the energy equation um, okay, so this is our uh, energy equation so remember in uh, the uh, chapter on forced convection we mentioned that um, it's it's uh, very typical to solve to decouple the uh, 
the uh, momentum equation and the energy equations but that is not possible in this case because uh, if you see the equation number 2 prime you have a term involving t so without having an information about the temperature as a function of x and y that is the temperature inside the boundary layer you cannot solve this equation and uh, to solve 3 you um, already need u and v so you cannot solve for the temperature equation without getting u and v so you have to um, basically solve equations number 2 prime and 3 um, together okay so they are highly coupled with each other and they have to be solved together now um, for ideal gases this uh, coefficient beta I mean using the ideal gas equation using the ideal gas equation which is uh, PB equals nRT or we can write P equals uh, rho RT so um, this this beta which is uh, given as uh, um, minus 1 by rho and then you have del rho by del t so rho can be written as the p upon rt and since we're talking about a constant pressure so we we have a p by r and then um, del by del t of 1 upon t that becomes a minus 1 upon t square so this becomes a plus so you have p upon rho rt squared so p upon rho rt can be written as uh, 1 from the ideal gas equation so this becomes 1 upon t so what we see is that uh, beta is equal to 1 by t uh, for ideal gases so we can substitute beta equals 1 by t for ideal gases in in this equation but for other other situations we have to know the value of beta as a function of t uh, for solving equation number 2 prime Now this uh, system of equations that we have obtained, our job is to solve them and uh, of course we won't solve it here but as we did earlier in a force convection, we will try to use the idea of non-dimensionalization and get some sort of uh, understanding of the behavior of the, um, or the um, dependence of the solution on non-dimensional parameters. So like we did earlier, we, we uh, non-dimensionalize our length as um, uh, using the, um, the characteristic length capital L, which um, in this case of the vertical plate can be the length of the plate. Same, same is what we use for the um, Y. So we use uh, the same length L. Now for the velocity, we use a characteristic velocity u naught okay, um, I have not told you what u naught is because the choice of u naught was quite obvious in force convection it was the free stream uh, velocity but here we don't have a free stream velocity okay so um, we, we just leave it to some uh, u naught I will discuss uh, later what this u naught what the options of u naught are but this of course is a constant and then we have uh, we, we non-dimensionalize the temperature using the same ideas so t minus ts upon um, ts minus t infinity so we can see that on this uh, uh, this is vertical plate um, on the surface of the plate we have um, t equals ts so t star becomes uh, 0 and as you go further so um, beyond the boundary layer thickness then your temperature becomes equal uh, to t infinity and uh, I'm sorry uh, this uh, made a mistake here this is t minus t infinity upon t s minus t infinity okay so on the surface uh, your temperature is t s so uh, t star becomes 1 and uh, outside the boundary layer you have uh, t equals t infinity so t star becomes 0 so t star goes from 1 to 0 as you go 
uh, vertically upwards um, in, in, in this situation. So if I um, use these non-dimensional parameters and write my equation, um, I won't show the uh, steps. I will just write the final form. Okay, so this is uh, our momentum equation. And this is our energy equation. Okay, the energy equation looks very similar to what we obtained earlier, uh, but the momentum equation looks uh, slightly different because we have this uh, term containing the uh, buoyancy term. Now, um, what what we do is uh, remember we we did not have any choice for u naught. So uh, one way to choose a u naught is that this term, this is coefficient of t star that we have in the momentum equation becomes one. Okay. So if this is the case, then your u naught, the choice of u naught becomes, or u naught square becomes So with this, um, with this u naught that you have now chosen, we, we can call this whole thing to the power half. So if you substitute this u naught into your Reynolds number, because Reynolds number uh, um, requires a length scale, so um, your Reynolds number then becomes uh, using this u naught. Okay, so this is what the Reynolds number becomes when you use this u naught, and this u naught, this choice of u naught is based on the um, coefficient of t star becoming one. Okay, it's it's our choice to choose u naught, so we choose choose this one, and um, this Reynolds number, um, actually um, the square of this Reynolds number that we have obtained. Uh, we, we gave it another name which we call the Grashof number based on the length L. So we have a square here. Okay, so this is a new non-dimensional number. Uh, that that we have um, introduced in free convection situations. Okay, uh, so this Grashof number uh, uh, denotes uh, a ratio of the buoyancy term or the buoyancy forces, a buoyancy force to the viscous force. 
So remember the Reynolds number that we had in forced convection was the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. This Grashof number is a ratio of the buoyancy force to the viscous force. And uh, what we see in this case is uh, that um, remember earlier our Nussel number was uh, uh, a function of uh, Reynolds number and Prandtl number. In this case, it is a fun is, is is a function of the um, Grashof number and the Prandtl number. Okay, so uh, just a quick summary. So this Grashof number is obtained. Uh, when we use a choice of u0 in such a way so that this ratio becomes 1. So we can replace 1 in terms of this ratio and then this Reynolds number that we have here actually um, it becomes this one. So since we, we don't want to use the same definition as Reynolds number so we call it the Grashof number. In fact uh, Reynolds number is uh, the uh, square of Grashof number okay, in this in this case now this choice of u naught um, works well when you are when, when you're dealing with purely free convection situations that is the ambient fluid is completely stationary but there are situations where you have some sort of a free stream velocity. So this is uh, what we call the um, combined uh, situation. Okay, so you have combined convection that is you have uh, both forced and free. Okay, so you have some external um, forcing as well which is driving the flow so you have a u infinity here uh, but uh, you also have a gravity term um, and uh, a delta t which is ultimately then resulting in um, some uh, flow okay. so in that case um, you, you cannot use your u naught to uh, define Reynolds number Reynolds number in this case has to be defined using u infinity. So in that case what happens is that uh, remember the in, in the momentum equation on the right hand side I will write the x momentum equation. Okay, So we had a term uh, which was uh, the convection term uh, the advection term and on the right hand side you had this t star which had some coefficient which was uh, g beta ts minus t infinity and then uh, you had an l divided by u naught square Okay, so this is what we had. Um, so in this case, since the Reynolds number now is defined using u infinity, um, so and and the Grashof number still is um, the same definition. So the Grashof number Is this uh, so what happens is that the coefficient of uh, t star which is this one is not one in this case and if I substitute uh, this in terms of Grashof and Reynolds number so what I see is that this coefficient becomes um, Grashof number upon the square of Reynolds number which is uh, defined using u infinity So this is what you have. So what this means is, I mean, um, uh, that the Nussel number in this case 
um, is uh, some function of uh, Reynolds number, Grashof number, and Prandtl number. Okay, so the Nusser number dependence is uh, now this Reynolds number that we have here is based on u infinity. Okay, so we have to um, take all these non-dimensional parameters into account because the equation has them. The non the, the dimensionless version of the equation has them. So the Nusser number will also depend on these parameters. Um, and uh, since we're talking about a combined situation, it could happen that uh, one of these uh, forced or free would start dominating. So if your uh, uh, if if your Grashof number upon Reynolds number square is, is much greater than one, so that means that the uh, Reynolds number is uh, dominating. Sorry, uh, is is much less than one. Let's say. So that means the Reynolds number is dominating as compared to the Grashof number. Reynolds number here is based on u infinity. So um, that means that uh, the forced convection dominate dominates. Okay, so if the forced convection dominates, then um, you don't need to consider the free convection. And on the other hand, if you have this uh, ratio uh, much much greater than one, that means your uh, Grashof number dominates. So that means that you have um, uh, uh, you, you can uh, consider this to be a purely free convection situation. So you can neglect the forced convection effects. Okay, so the Nusser number becomes a function of Grashof and Prandtl number only. Okay. Um, in this case, um, the Nusser number is um, a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number. Sorry. Only. And, and um, remember that uh, don't confuse when you're talking about a purely um, uh, a free convection situation, then uh, which is this one, then uh, Reynolds number is um, in this case is simply the uh, the square root of Grashof number. So um, let's do a quick recap. So the Grashof number is, uh, as we said, is sorry, let's see, it's equal to is a ratio of the buoyancy force and the viscous force, as uh, given here, uh, where L is the characteristic length, beta being the thermal coefficient, expansion coefficient, and you can uh, for for liquids you can use uh, these tables where we uh, where um, the values of beta are tabulated. And as we said, for a perfect or an ideal gas, you have beta equals 1 by temperature, where the temperature is in Kelvin. So one has to be careful again here to use the right units. And uh, there's another thing uh, which is called a Rayleigh number. Okay. So Rayleigh number is defined as the product of the Grashof and Pantel number. So this is what the Rayleigh number is. And uh, it's, it's uh, quite useful, this, this Rayleigh number, when deciding whether the flow is uh, laminar or turbulent. Uh, so we will talk about um, Rayleigh number uh, further. So um, as I said in the combined situation, also known as mixed convection, you have both forced and free convection effects being uh, comparable. So if um, your um, the, the ratio as we just discussed that is the ratio of the crash of number to the um, square of Reynolds number is uh, is uh, much much greater than one. So this is uh, much much greater. So in that case, uh, you, it's it's free convection dominant, and if it's much less than one, um, then it's a forced convection dominant. Can if if this is of order uh, one, 
um, then uh, it's just neither much less than one nor much more than one so then you have to consider both free and forced convection situation or the mixed convection situation So in this mixed convection situation, then your Nusselt number is, um, um, is is basically a sum of both forced and free. Well, it's a plus minus here because uh, they could either support each other or oppose each other. Um, so, for example, if you have a flow happening uh, from, well, let's take this vertical plate that we've been talking about. So, um, if you have this um, hot plate then uh, that will result in the uh, flow velocity upwards uh, but you could actually have a situation where you were forcing the fluid downwards so the u infinity was actually downwards but since the gravity is downward um, then uh, a free convection results in a flow upwards so they oppose each other so in that case the Nusselt number or the Nusselt number to the power of n has um, to be um, calculated using the opposing effects of forced and natural convection okay and if, if they are supporting each other so if for example this uh, plate was actually cold and then what happens is that instead of uh, uh, the flow going up the flow actually because of natural or a free convection the flow starts going down and you also have uh, the flow going down because of forced convection so then the two effects add rather than uh, so they support each other this is just a repetition of what we have discussed so this is uh, what we discussed for a vertical heated plate you have this um, sorry. you have this uh, velocity that develops because of uh, the buoyancy force okay so as we said that uh, for a cooled plate instead of the velocity going up we have the velocity downwards so this is again repetition of what we already have discussed so um, our x momentum equation which has this uh, buoyancy term and the energy equation looks the same and as i said that they are coupled to each other now like we um, solved these equations earlier using the idea of um, similarity solutions we can do the same here um, again I, I won't go into details of that and solve it but you can uh, define a similarity variable eta uh, in such a way so that it combines both x and y so then um, your uh, temperature or the non-dimensional temperature will simply become a function of um, eta so then you can you uh, convert your PD or PDEs to ODE and you can solve this ODE okay, so this is how we define an eta in this case but I won't go into details okay, so you can do the same ideas and numerically integrate them and finally get your um, uh, uh, f prime eta as a function of eta On the left hand side you see the uh, um, velocity and on the right hand side you see the uh, temperature um, so it's again very interesting so um, um, here we see t star as a function of eta so as our eta increases now, now eta increasing is equivalent to either saying that y is increasing or x is decreasing so if my y increases that means I'm going um, in this direction so my heated plate is along this direction so then I'm going um, away perpendicularly from the plate so uh, we see that the uh, temperature drops let's take any one of these lines so we see the temperature drops and ultimately reaches the uh, t infinity value so t star as we said it goes from 1 to 0 it's normalized so this is how it drops okay um, similarly if um, uh, we're talking about the eta increasing uh, equivalent to y increasing but it's also equivalent to x decreasing 
और इफ एक्स इंक्रीजेस माई ईटा डिक्रीजेस and uh, this this figure also shows the effect of uh, the increase of parental number so um, as uh, my parental number increases so the parental number is increasing in this direction uh, so as the parental number increases now what we see is that the temperature boundary layer becomes much thinner and thinner now remember parental number was uh, the ratio of the momentum diffusivity to the thermal diffusivity so parental number increasing uh, basically means that your um, the, the contribution um, of uh, assuming that the new is the same your alpha is decreasing so a smaller alpha means a smaller diffusivity which basically means that a thermal diffusivity I mean, which which basically means that um, uh, if 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 you have a smaller value of thermal diffusivity, that means that the uh, temperature effects will diffuse much um, uh, smaller in distance. Um, so, if if you have a Prandtl number of a very large value, then um, for for that fluid, if if we compare two Prandtl number fluids, one a uh, low and one a large, uh, one one a high value. so the high prandtl number basically means that it has a low relative thermal diffusivity so um, it will diffuse much less so that means that um, it will have a very thin boundary layer as compared to the smaller prandtl number value and this is this is what we see in this uh, solution for the laminar flow on a vertical vertical heated plate and remember that this situation this is a solution uh, theoretical solution Uh, well, of course, the ODE is a solved uh, numerically, but uh, otherwise the ODE is formulated using theoretical ideas, the ideas of similarity. Okay. So I won't go into details of the solution. Okay. So in this case, uh, the uh, Nusser numbers. Uh, based on both x and the average value for the whole plate uh, can be calculated using the um, eta dependence of temperature which comes out to be this uh, so it's grashof number upon 4 to the power of 1 by 4 times a function g which is only a function of prandtl number so this function g is given as this this is obtained using uh, fitting the um, numerical solution values Okay, and what we see is that the average Nusser number is um, four by three of the um, Nusser number, local Nusser number at x equals l. Okay, next is uh, remember we said that this is all for laminar situations, but um, of course, like um, you had in the previous first convection situation, you can also you also have uh, transition for the flow transition to turbulence um, as the boundary layer becomes um, turbulent. um after a certain critical distance uh, in the plate so uh, we uh, characterize that transition using uh, rayleigh number which was um, as we defined earlier as a product of the grashof number and the uh, prandtl number okay so uh, based on the critical length which is critical distance from the uh, plate uh, plate edge um what we've seen is that for the flow starts to transition from laminar to turbulent at a rayleigh number value of 10 to the power of 9 for these free convection situations so one has to check the rayleigh number value first and if the rayleigh number value is less than this 10 to the 9 uh, we use the laminar uh, correlations and ideas what if this value is greater than 10 to the 9 then we have to be careful and uh, um, calculate our heat transfer coefficients as um, a mixed uh, boundary layer where you have uh, the laminar as well as turbulent contributions okay um now um, as we have, as we have been discussing earlier that uh, we tend to use empirical um, correlations a lot so um uh, for for laminar situations that is really number um, less than 10 to the power of 9 uh, this uh, correlation works quite well and um, in fact you have this um, correlation uh, which is available for all 
sort of situation. So, um, doesn't matter if the flow is laminar or turbulent, it fits quite well. So we, we tend to use uh, those correlations. Uh, um, um, quite commonly. Okay. Uh, till now we have talked about vertical plates, but it um, can happen that the plates we are dealing with are horizontal or for that matter even inclined. Okay. So if, if the uh, plate is horizontal, then um, um, let's say like this. So the buoyancy force in this case um, um, let's say the plate is hot so the fluid rises um, so this is gravity and this is uh, the um, direction of buoyancy force upwards so um, you can see that the uh, force firstly is um, perpendicular to the plate rather than being parallel and in this case uh, there is one very interesting thing that happens that uh, the flow of heat transfer uh, so th the flow and heat transfer it depends whether the plate is heated or cooled and whether it is uh, facing upwards or downwards okay so let's uh, take um, the, these situations and understand those um, those cases so in this case in in the first case we have um, a hot plate facing upwards so uh, what that means is the bottom is um, uh, this is no heat transfer happening here it's insulated so the, the top surface is uh, hot so that means that uh, whatever fluid um, contacts the top surface it gets hot and as it gets hot it starts to rise and when it rises it creates some sort of vacuum and then that that pulls in the cold fluid downwards so what you see is that you have these localized um, uh, flow um, currents that develop. In fact, these these um, are three-dimensional in nature. So if you were to look at the plate like this, so you will see these uh, uh, these uh, uh, flow um, the flow on the surface uh, will will some some will be uh, somehow like this. So it's, it's, it's like a broken boundary layer that you have here rather than uh, those nice and uh, smooth uh, boundary layer that you had in this uh, vertical plate situation. So here um, you have this um, cold fluid pulled in and the hot fluid going up. So the, these channels that develop create a lot of mixing um, in, in, on the top of the plate. So all this mixing results in an increased value of uh, heat transfer coefficient which is uh, good in in many situations where you want uh, the plate to cool as soon as possible okay similarly uh, if, if you look at now the situation number two where you have a cold plate so that means the temperature the surface temperature of the plate is uh, less than the ambient temperature so in this cold plate situation if it's facing downwards that is uh, the top part is um, insulated so again uh, since the air that uh, that it is uh, touching the plate is getting cold so it, it tends to fall down and when the air falls down it pulls in the um, relatively hotter air from the ambient and you again have these circulations that are developed and which leads to a lot of mixing um, around the plate surface uh, because of the um, fresh fluid um, being pulled in uh, and the boundary layer sort of being broken uh, which which results in an increased heat transfer again okay so you can calculate the uh, Nusser number using this relation but um, the only difference here is that uh, the, um, the the coefficient is different depending on whether the plate is hotter or colder than the ambient So um, this I'll leave it for you to uh, work with. Um, now, as I said that uh, although we're talking about horizontal plates, but the plates can be inclined. So like this. So if, if you have a plate um, which is, uh, let's say, um, hot. So the plate is hot. 
and uh, the gravity of course is downwards so this uh, top surface of the plate um, results in um, uh, I mean um, sorry the inclination of the plate um, what happens is that the uh, flow tends to rise up because the buoyancy is in this direction so it create it, it results in uh, um, you, you can um, you can uh, you can take components of this in uh, the tangential and the normal directions of this flow so um, what, what we see is that the tangential component is uh, simply because of um, g cos theta Um, so um, it it uh, I mean of course remember this tangential component ultimate results in the uh, flow velocities in free convection. So if uh, the the plate is um, tending more towards horizontal, sorry, uh, this uh, should be uh, this this uh, component reduces. So as as your theta approaches zero, then uh, this this uh, contribution of gravity. In the tangential direction flow becomes uh, negligible. I mean, the tangential, tangential direction flow becomes almost zero. So uh, the um, gravity it sees is uh, g sine theta. So it's a reduced uh, gravity. Um, but uh, so so what happens is that um, the heat transfer coefficient remember is, is proportional to your u value so if you increase the flow speed it results in a higher heat transfer coefficient so since in a free convection situation if you incline the plate you will end up reducing the u um, as your theta decreases and that will ultimately result in decrease in h uh, but what is also happening is since you have this um, normal component developing so that is um, uh, creating some flow in the normal direction but the uh, there is no constraint here so the uh, flow tends to rise and then um, as as we had in this horizontal plate the same thing happens here so the hot air tends to rise away from the plate which results in the flow being pulled in from the sides because of uh, that vacuum being created so this cold air rushes in the hot air rises up and you have this again uh, a flow that develops on the surface breaking the boundary layer from the top uh, resulting in increased uh, mixing and then increased H. So typically the reduction in the uh, heat transfer coefficient because of the uh, reduced U component in the uh, tangential direction because of the lower the, the um, smaller gravity um, uh, smaller apparent gravity it sees because of the inclination so the contribution, the, the reduction in this U um, is, is not um, that large as compared to the increase in the heat transfer coefficient because of this vertical breaking of boundary layer. So effectively uh, we see an increase in the heat transfer coefficient by inclining the plate. Okay. So the, when, when the plate inclines from the vertical uh, position, you uh, typically see an increase in the heat transfer coefficient because of this breakage in the boundary layer. And you have then the opposite situations where, uh, for example, in this case, um, you have uh, uh, a hot surface which is uh, facing downwards. Uh, so the top is insulated. So uh, what happens is that the uh, fluid which is touching the hot surface, it becomes hot. It tends to rise, but it cannot rise because there's a constraint of the plate on the top. So you don't see much of a uh, much of a flow. Uh, which results in oh, uh, an overall low heat transfer coefficient in both cases because of the plate constraint. Okay, so as uh, so they result in a uh, smaller heat transfer rate. So let us um, solve an example. So uh, we have uh, a glass door, fire screen. So let's look. 
So let us also look at this schematic here. So you have this um, glass panel door, and on the right, on the on the left hand side, um, let's say you have uh, um, uh, fire, or you have this. Uh, um, I mean, this is you have a chimney which which will extract the uh, hot air and fire in case there is one. So this glass panel door has a height of um, 0.71 meters and a width of 1.02 meters. And the left hand side temperature can reach uh, or the uh, uh, you can assume that the glass panel temperature can reach, uh, reach a total of uh, 232 degrees centigrade. So if, if the room on the right hand side is at 23 degrees centigrade that's the uh, ambient temperature um, in case there is a fire happening you have to estimate the convection rate of heat transfer from um, left to right so this um, glass panel door that you have how much heat will convect from here to the room because the room uh, in which uh, you may have people um, uh, should be safe Um, so in this case, um, you can uh, one has to understand that uh, this is a free convection situation because you don't have um, a flow happening. So the only convection that will happen here is free convection or natural convection. So the assumptions here are the screen is at a uniform temperature. So you can assume that the whole screen is at um, the temperature that is given to us, which is uh, 232 degrees centigrade. The room air is um, quiescent. So it is not there is no forced convection in the room, and you can assume an ideal gas and constant properties. Okay. So one important thing to note here is that when making calculations um, in in uh, free convection, we use the film temperature. Okay. So this film temperature is the average of the surface temperature and the free steam temp or the ambient temperature. Okay. So Tf is uh, T surface plus T infinity divided by 2. Okay. Uh, now to calculate the rate of heat transfer because of free convection we have to use the Newton's law of cooling. Uh, for that we have to estimate the H bar. Now first then we have to know that whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. Um, um, and, and we, we can use the correlations for the vertical plate here because you have a vertical door uh, pane. So let's calculate the Rayleigh number first. So the Rayleigh, Rayleigh number it comes out to be greater than 10 to the power of 9. So that means that the, the a part of the boundary layer is turbulent. And as I showed you earlier that you have these correlation which works for both um, of the complete range um, including laminar and turbulent. So we can use that this is average Nusselt number um, correlation which requires you, uh, the value of Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. So we substitute the values and uh, this gives us the average Nusselt number of 147. And then uh, the average Nusselt number is based on the length of the plate and the um, thermal conductivity of uh, the fluid. So uh, when we substitute those values, we get an average H value of 7.0 watts per meter square Kelvin. Um, so you can see that this is uh, much smaller than what we uh, the, the H bar values we have seen in force convection situations. So when you substitute that you get um, a convective um, um, heat uh, flow rate of 1060 watts. Okay, so a couple of comments. Um, in this case it was given to us, um, I mean we were asked to calculate the convection rate by, and we neglected radiation. But uh, remember that radiation um, cannot be neglected in all situations. In fact, in situations where we are dealing with um, natural convection, uh, since the uh, rate of heat flow is much small in natural convection, so the radiative um, heat flow rates can be uh, quite um, comparative or even more. So in, in this case, uh, if, if we just want to estimate the radiative uh, heat flow rates, uh, we can assume the emissivity of uh, 1 for glass. Um, the surface area is given to us. The Stephen Boltzmann constant is given to us. Um, the surrounding temperature we assume as uh, 25 degrees centigrade or 23 degrees centigrade. And the surface temperature is given to be um, uh, 
230 degree centigrade so that gives um, the radiative um, uh, rate of heat transfer as 2355 which is uh, much more than the uh, rate of convection that we calculated so in this case it was um, um, quite uh, important that we had used we had considered radiative uh, rate as well okay so one has to be careful about that one solving problems so um, that, that brings us to the end of this um, chapter on um, free, free convection and that also brings us to an end on uh, the discussion on convection. Um, we will briefly talk about another topic which is related to convection in the next lecture which is uh, phase change phenomena that is uh, boiling and condensation because um, again if you remember the first few lectures where we talked about convection we uh, mentioned that the uh, heat transfer coefficient h is uh, the smallest for natural convection it is uh, a few orders of magnitude um, higher for force convection and if you talk about phase change phenomena like boiling and condensation then the h values can be extremely high so if, if one wants very large values of h one has to go to um, uh, phase, phase change um, uh, processes so we will briefly touch upon them in the next lecture without going into too much detail we'll just talk about um, uh, the basic ideas um, and engineering correlations uh, and then we will uh, jump over to the third mode of heat transfer which is radiation thank you